Mark Morrison is serving as Deputy Chief of Staff to Senator Robert Bennett, Republican from Utah. And in this, he oversees all legislative activity, but is particularly involved with areas connected to his background, which are in the military, in intelligence, and also in terms of foreign, relation, foreign policy and foreign relations. Um, Mr. Morrison retired from the Air Force after 25 years as a lieutenant colonel. He has served in active duty in Germany in doing analysis for NATO. He served two years as a Middle East Area special, Specialist and studied Arabic at Monterey for one year. So has come in as to us as a Middle East expert. And he served three years as an intelligence officer in the White House with the National Security Council. He has a lot of experience in the Pentagon and with the Department of Defense as well. He also has private experience with Lockheed Martin Corporation, where he worked on legislative strategies related to defense spending. He has a background at BYU. He's a graduate of BYU, of Troy State University, and also did graduate work at the Naval Postgraduate School. Now, I know you're dying to know if he has other BYU connections. He has three children who have graduated from BYU, have married BYU graduates, and are training their children to come to BYU. And he's presently serving as a bishop, so he has the whole realm of affairs. We are happy to have you here. And we'll turn the time over to you. I think what we're going to do is um, just let him talk for 25 minutes or so, and then take questions. So. Thank you very much for the, the introduction. It was very comprehensive. Um, and it's good to be back here at BYU. I also have a brother who teaches here. If you've seen me around campus, uh, it's because I have an identical twin brother who teaches in the education department. And I was just over to see him. and. And he's moved to a different office since I was here last. And so I went into the building and I said, do you know where my office is? You know, to one of the receptionists, because <laughs> I look just like him. And uh, doing double takes and stuff. So it was kind of funny. It's always funny to be around him because I look just like him. People think that I am him. And people that I know think that he's me. So it's kind of fun. But it's fun to be back here at BYU. 30 years ago, I was sitting in your seat um, as an international relations major and also uh, political science minor, I was one or two classes away from a double major, and I uh, was sitting there thinking, hey, this is really fun, really interesting, really great, but what am I going to do with this? Where do I go from here? So th that was 30 years ago. That sound, makes it sound like an old man, doesn't it, when I say 30 years ago I was a student like you. But I was 30 years ago, and since that time I have um, spent 25 years in the Air Force, 13 years working for Lockheed Martin Corporation, the defense industry. Uh, I was, uh, worked for about 10 years in the Pentagon, uh, a couple of different times, but about 10 years total. Three years at the White House, uh, three years in NATO. So uh, probably a few other things, but I've had a number of different lives, all kind of related to the same thing, all related to um, political science in one sense, but also international relations, in uh, military affairs, foreign relations, aerospace, a lot of different things. What, uh, and so I worked at a lot of those different places. Let me tell you kind of how I got started when I was in your chair 30 years ago. When I was here, I was thinking, I gotta get a job. I was married at the time when I was at BYU. I had one child, our oldest was, was born. Actually, I was, my wife and I were at Rick's before we came down here. But we had a daughter, and then uh, we had a son who was born shortly after I graduated. And I thought, man, I've got to get a job and start earning money to feed these guys and take care of this family. And so I started looking around while I was here. My last year at BYU, I started looking around, and uh, CIA came around. They were recruiting. I talked to them. Uh, NSA was here. I, I talked to them, took their test. I don't know if you guys have taken a test from them. It's probably different now than it, than it was then, but they, I had a test that I took from them. Uh, they were interested, and CIA was too, and I talked to the military services to see if there was any, any interest there, and, uh, and there was. And so I uh, started looking at the different options. Um, NSA wasn't as interesting um, as the others to me. I mean, it's, it's a great place to work. There's a lot of really good folks up there, and they do a, a great service. I've 
done an awful lot with NSA. Uh, but that wasn't, I didn't want to go there. Uh, CIA was interesting, although they were more interested in the covert kind of side of things, the operations is what they call it, um, rather than the analysis, the intelligence side. And I was more interested in being an analyst at, uh, at CIA headquarters than I was being a, a spy overseas somewhere. And so I, uh, so I thought of that, and I talked to the, the services, the military services, and uh, I don't know if anybody's ROTC here, but I went to uh, uh, the different services. When I looked at them, I thought, uh, I, I kind of went towards the Air Force, because I, I thought that the Air Force was kind of the civil service, you know, the one that treats people a little bit different than the others. So, so I went to the Air Force, and so as it turned out, that looked like to be the best option. Uh, I also took the Foreign Service exam and was one point away from passing it. And I didn't want to stick around and wait till the next year. And so I wanted to get out and do something. So I ended up uh, signing on to the Air Force. In the contract that I signed, it was, you're going to be an in intelligence officer and uh, guaranteed four-year commitment. And so I thought, great, I'll get four years of experience in the Air Force. After that, then I'm going to go to the State Department or go to the CIA or somewhere after that. So I went, I went to Germany. That was my first assignment was to Germany. It was a NATO, little NATO organization. Uh, in Germany, and, and uh, at that time, this was before Central Command was created, and so NATO had a lot more uh, jurisdiction, at least uh, um, geographically, than it has now. And so the Middle East was part of that. And so I kind of focused on the Middle East, because I could kind of do whatever I wanted to do. I was briefing the commander of this NATO organization, and I briefed him on a lot of stuff, because we had uh, a lot of things going on. Poland is about to be invaded in 19... 80, I don't know if you, well, you probably don't remember that, but anyway, 1980, Poland was about to be invaded. We were pretty sure it was going to be because it was surrounded by Soviet troops, and we were just waiting for that to happen. Um, and so we were really focused on that. Uh, at, uh, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, fall of 79, and uh, in fact, it was during a big exercise. But I, let me tell you just real briefly, I don't, we're going to get out of control here in a minute because I got a lot of other things I want to talk to you about, but we were, we were in the middle of an exercise. I was briefing kind of the, the, the fake war that was going on because they have the orange forces. They don't call it red. There's orange is the bad guys and blue is the good guys. So I was telling them all about what the orange forces were doing. And the colonel that was there that I was briefing uh, said, well, what about Afghanistan? And at first I thought, well, Afghanistan isn't part of this scenario. We're not using real names of countries even, you know, we're using weird phony names. But he, but he said, what's going on with Afghanistan? Because the Soviet Union just invaded. And, and so we started focusing on the real world Afghanistan, the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan. So I was involved in, in keeping track of that and keeping track of uh, and keeping the commanders there briefed on that. So anyway, I spent three years in, in Germany doing um, a lot of Soviet Union related stuff and Warsaw Pact stuff, but also doing as much Middle East stuff as I could because I had interest in that. At the same time, I applied for what the Air Force calls the Area Specialist Program and was accepted into that as a, uh, a young first lieutenant. And uh, they sent me to Monterey, California for two years to learn Arabic uh, kind of history, culture, uh, religion, and Arabic language um, at the, at the uh, Defense Language Institute. So I spent two years there in Monterey just kind of immersing myself in Middle East issues and uh, wrote a, uh, a master's thesis uh, called Understanding the PLO, is what I called it. And it was a study of the, uh, the PLO and the different factions in the PLO, different personalities in the PLO, and trying to figure out what it was that made them think the way they thought and decide to do the things that they decided to do and think the way they thought. And so I, sp I spent a lot of time studying that and wrote up this, uh, um, uh, this uh, master's thesis on that. And then, uh, and then I started looking for a job then. Uh, you know, if you think you're in the military, you don't need to look for a job. You really kind of do, because there's lots of different places to go in the military. But I, but I wanted to go to Washington, D.C. I wanted to go to the Pentagon. And so, uh, in, f in fact, the guy from the Pentagon called me before I even needed to call him. He called me and, and asked, asked if I was interested in working at the Pentagon as a Middle East analyst for the Air Force Chief of Staff. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. So that's where I went after I finished at uh, Monterey. Went there and, um, and spent about a year and a half, two years or so working at the Pentagon and briefed the Air Force Chief of Staff twice a week during that time. Now, does anybody here watch 24? I do. And you know CTU, right? Um, that's the counterterrorism unit. When I was at the, the, at the Pentagon, they created 
something called the CTC, the Counterterrorism Center. And, and I was the Air Force guy that was detailed to work at the CTC. Uh, and there was an awful lot of, of terrorist activity going on at that time. Uh, I mean, terrorism isn't a new thing. It's something that's been around for a long time. And, and there were a lot of airplanes that were hijacked back in those days, and a lot of Americans that were in Lebanon that were kidnapped and held hostage. Uh, there's an awful lot going on, and so the Air Force, and in fact DOD decided they needed to create a, a counterterrorism center. So I was the Air Force guy. And um, back around that same time, there was an operation called El Dorado Canyon where we bombed Libya. Do you remember hearing about that? And uh, when uh, and that was in retaliation for terrorist activity that Libya had been involved in. And so the CTC was involved in in planning that. And so I was one of the guys that uh, that uh, put together the target list. They said, well, if if you were going to bomb Libya, if you wanted to hurt Libya, what would you bomb? What what kind of targets would you hit? And so we would so we put together a list of targets. And so we were one of those, we were one of those, the ones that put the target list together. And and uh, for that operation. So anyway, we so I did that. And uh, at that same time, when I was at the Pentagon, um, there was a, there was a friend of mine who had gone before a couple of years before, soon after I got there, went over to the White House to work, and he came back to our office and said, "Hey, there's a there's the Air Force guy that's that's over at the at the White House is leaving." And I, there's a lot of folks that are detailed to the NSC, the National Security Council. Most of the National Security Council staff are not uh, White House employees. They're mostly detailed over from different agencies. There's a lot of State Department folks, a lot of uh, CIA people. Um, those are probably the two biggest, but they also DOD. I guess the, the DOD, those are the three biggest. So anyway, there was, a, there was a job for an Air Force guy that was about my rank. He was about to leave to go to Korea, and, the, and this guy said, hey, uh, we need somebody to take his place. So they asked who in our, in our Pentagon office is interested. I said, hey, I'm interested in doing that. So I threw my hat in. They called me over for a few interviews, I, and they said, we'd like you to work over there. So I went over to the White House and worked for three years. And most of that time was spent, again, on counterterrorism stuff, but also Middle East stuff. Um, do you guys know Dennis Ross, who has retired now, but he was kind of the, our main Middle East uh, envoy uh, in the last several administrations. Dennis was over there at that time. Ambassador Oakley, I don't know if you remember Bob Oakley, but uh, Ambassador Oakley was my boss over there. So I worked over there for a few years, three years, working uh, a lot of uh, Afghanistan stuff, um, keeping track of Soviet forces in Afghanistan, but more than that, uh, it's, it's counterterrorism stuff. And back in, I think it was 1987, there was an awful lot of activity in the Persian Gulf, and we had naval forces out there. There had been a lot of uh, Iranian uh, naval activity uh, coming out to, it wasn't a real big threat, but they had some guns and they were shooting at some of our ships that were out there. They just had these little, what they call little bog hammer boats. They were just, they were really small boats, but they had machine guns and, and uh, they were shooting at our ships. So um, one night, it was, it was, I think it was July 5th, because I think it was just the day after the 4th of July. I got a call like at 2 o'clock in the morning or so saying um, there's some activity in, they couldn't really, I didn't have a secure phone at home, so they couldn't say much, but they said there's some activity going on in the Persian Gulf that you ought to be aware of, you might want to come in. And I thought, well, it's probably just this bog hammer stuff again, nothing big deal. And then uh, they called back a little while later and said, no, it's, um, an airplane has been shot down. And so I, so I got dressed, went into the White House, and on the way in I heard on the news that, uh, um, that there had been an aircraft that had been shot down. When I got to the White House, they were saying it looked like it was an F-14. Because um, they had seen on the radar, they'd been seeing these aircraft, F-14s taking off out of southern part of Iran, and this looked like the same thing, it, only this aircraft, when it took off, was coming toward one of the ships that was out there, and they radioed to it, said, you better turn, and he didn't turn. And so they shot it down after they'd given it warning. After they shot it down, thinking it was an F-14, as the boats went over, they found out it wasn't. It was an airliner. It was an Iranian aircraft. And there were probably two or, two or 300 people on board that were all killed, and they were out there in the Persian Gulf. 
And so um, from that time, I had been monitoring some of these really classified, this is NSA stuff, uh, really classified kind of channel of intelligence information, uh, listening to the terrorists radio about that or, or talk to each other about that. And they were saying, we've got to retaliate for it. We've got to do something about it. And as the months went by, the, uh, the, the intercepts that we got were more specific. And uh, they started talking about how they were going to do it. And they were talking about uh, retaliating by taking out a, a U.S. or, uh, well, the U.S. aircraft. And then they started talking about where they were going to do it. They said, we're going to be do it, going to do it in Europe somewhere. And then they said, the way we're going to do it is we're going to take um, a radio, one of, these, you know, one of these boom box kind of radios uh, from that time. They, they said, we're going to use one of those and make it look like it's a radio, but we're going to put a bomb inside of it. And we're going to have a, 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 a triggering mechanism so that when you take off, you get to a certain altitude and it'll blow up. And uh, that we're going to get it in through Athens, because Athens is pretty lax in security. So we'll get into Athens, then it'll probably be Munich or Frankfurt or somewhere that we're going to put this on. But we didn't know exactly where. It might have been Paris. We weren't sure exactly where. We weren't exa ex exactly sure when, but we knew it was going to be sometime in December is what it was looking like. And so um, on, September, uh, on December, I think it was the 26th or 27th, um, there's a Pan Am flight that was leaving Frankfurt that uh, blew up over Scotland. And uh, as soon as that happened, I knew exactly who had planned it and what it was all about, because I had all this stuff uh, there. And so I was able to go to the, the National Security Advisor and say, hey, this is what happened. This is exactly who was involved, and here's the traffic that, that backs it up. Anyway, there were, there were a ton of other kinds of things similar to that. Um, let me tell you just one other thing. When I was uh, at the White House one day, um, General Powell, Colin Powell, Secretary Powell, was the National Security Advisor. He was supposed to be on a secure phone call. Um, what, what happened was we were sure that uh, Libya was involved in terrorist activity and was coordinating with Iran. And there was an Iranian aircraft that was in Tripoli, Libya. And we thought we knew what was on board that aircraft, and it was incriminating stuff that would show the Libyans and the Iranians were working together. And so after the aircraft took off, in flying back over to Iran, it was overflying Turkey. So there's a secure conference call where General Powell was supposed to be on it for the NSC. The Secretary of Defense um, was supposed to be on it. The uh, Secretary of State was supposed to be on it, and in fact was on it. I mean, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State were on it. The, the uh, Turkish Foreign Minister and the Turkish, you know, the Turkish Prime Minister and the Turkish Defense Minister were on the phone call. General Powell wasn't around, and so I was on the phone call. And we were trying to persuade the, uh, the Turkish government, the Turkish military, to launch aircraft to force this aircraft to land so that then we'd be able to show this incriminating information and, and uh, evidence that was on this aircraft. Anyway, they weren't buying it. The, the Turks didn't want to go for it, and so they let the aircraft go back over to Iran. But it was those kinds of things that, uh, that I was right in the middle of. Um, there were reflagging operations. Uh, anyway, a, a ton of things that happened at the White House that don't happen anywhere else uh, that was just um, an amazing kind of a place to work. After that, um, Remember, I was supposed to be in the Air Force for four years and then get out and go somewhere else. Ten years now had elapsed. And so I was thinking, you know, this Air Force thing wasn't supposed to be a career. You know, 20 years is a, is a career in the Air Force. I said, this isn't supposed to be a career. This is supposed to be just a, four, a, sh a short four-year thing and then move on to my real life and real career. And, uh, and so I had, since I've been in for 10 years, I thought, I've got the next 10 years pretty well programmed. A friend of mine... Uh, at that time was going over to be the air attache in Tel Aviv. In those days, the only place for an intelligence guy like me to, to serve in the Middle East was in, in Tel Aviv. Every other uh, air attache job had, was a pilot, somebody who could fly the ambassador around. And so the only slot for me was in Tel Aviv. So I thought, my friend is going to be over there for three years. During that time, I can finish some work that I was doing there in, in, D, in D.C., go to uh, one of the Air Force, the LS services have these intermediate service schools, Air Command and Staff College is what they call it. So I go there for a year. It's kind of like a master's equivalent kind of deal. 
So I thought I could go there for a year. After that, go to attache training and be ready to just take this guy's place. And I thought, hey, that's, that's a good plan. I'd be there for three years, maybe extend for four years. And then I come back to D.C. for another three or four years, finish my career, retire, and then stay working for a state or a CIA or something. Anyway, the Air Force didn't see the same thing. They didn't have the same vision that I had. They had a different vision in mind. And, and, uh, and so I left active duty that time. And it wasn't really a, a sad parting. Um, and I wasn't really looking really hard for another job. It's just that I found something. I, I, I talked to one guy, and he said, well, I talked to, says, talk to Senator Graham from Texas. So I went to talk to Senator Graham, and he said, do you want a job? So I said, sure. So I left active duty at that time, but I stayed in D.C. and went to work for Phil Graham as his uh, military guy, as his kind of military expert for about two years, uh, working all the military issues on Capitol Hill for him and legislation and funding and um, relations with the bases back in the state and all that kind of stuff. So I worked there for him for uh, about two years. And then uh, Lockheed came by and said, hey, we want someone to work for us. So I went to work for Lockheed and stayed there for 13 years. It's, it sounds like a long time, but I stayed there for 13 years working stuff. And, and it might sound kind of, and it was mainly working legislation stuff on Capitol Hill. There were some other things, but it mostly was Capitol Hill related stuff. And so up there, uh, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that, but let me just tell you one thing that I did there that I thought was pretty interesting. And you might think it's kind of funny, uh, maybe not laughing kind of funny, but kind of interesting funny. There was one of the programs that I worked on was, was a missile program. And you know that we have ICBMs and SLBMs. You know SLBMs, sea launch ballistic missiles? Um, and then bombers. That's kind of the old triad, those three elements. Lockheed Martin... Um, builds, has built the only SLBMs that the Air Force or the Navy has ever had, that the U.S. has ever had. Um, and so th that was one of the programs I was working, was making sure that there was funding to continue building these sea launch ballistic missiles. The D-5 is what it's called. And so uh, every year we would go to, I'd go to Capitol Hill and take our folks to Capitol Hill and we would um, go to the different offices, uh, the committee offices, personal offices, and try to get a group of people to support this program. When President Clinton was elected, and, and after he'd been there for a while, one of his buddies, um, Senator Bumpers from Arkansas, President Clinton was from Arkansas, you know, so D Dale Bumpers, Senator Bumpers, um, always, year after year, he would put forward these uh, amendments on the floor when the defense authorization bill was being debated to eliminate all funding for the D-5 program. And, uh, and I was afraid that President uh, Clinton would go for it, you know, that he would be philosophically opposed to it. But um, there was a friend of mine who he had, used to work for the Senate Armed Services Committee, he went over to the White House to work, uh, who I had gotten to know. So I called Bob and said, hey, what do you guys think about, you know, what do you guys in the White House think about the D5 program? And, and uh, he said, we understand the whole deal. We understand the importance of it. We understand why we need to have it. And so I was able to get, with Bob's help, um, a letter, in fact, several letters signed from President Clinton to Senator Bumper saying, we're going to support the D5 program. It's important for us. We need to have this thing going. He understood the, the nature of the triad, the, 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 the reality that we needed to have that, and so he was supportive of it. To me and, and to others, it was kind of a weird thing that we would get Senator, I mean, uh, President uh, Clinton to support that kind of a program because it didn't seem like it might philosophically fit with what he thought, but but he understood the bigger picture of what it was all about. So um, so I did that, but there been a bunch of other programs that I worked on and a bunch of other things that we got going um, in positive relations between Capitol Hill and, and defense industry. Now during this whole time, you know, during the couple of years I worked for Senator Graham, during the 13 years I worked on, uh, for Lockheed Martin, I was also still in the Air Force. You know, I was still a, uh, as a reservist, so I was still working, you know, at least one weekend a month, and then every uh, year a couple of week, a couple of weeks on active duty. So I spent uh, a lot of time still working, and, and that was as an intelligence officer, still working um, Middle East sometimes. Other times it was more worldwide focused, but there was an awful lot of Middle East stuff because a, a lot of, a lot of what goes on internationally is related to the Middle East. That's just kind of the nature of the. Of, the, uh, of that region. Now, on, uh, on September 11th, 2001, um, 
I was during, that was one of my weeks of active duty. You know, that was on a Tuesday. On that Monday, I reported to the Pentagon at 2 o'clock in the afternoon at the Secretary of Defense's Operations Center and uh, started monitoring the world. That was what we did. We monitored the world. We kept track of what was going on in the world to let him know and the rest of the, the OSD is what they call it, Office of Secretary of Defense, to let the rest of the OSD staff know what was going on in the world. And then uh, the next morning, I, I left there about 10 o'clock that night, 10.30 that night, and uh, the next morning I got up early, went to work at Lockheed Martin, got there about 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning with the plan to leave there about 1 o'clock or so, 1.30, and my office at Lockheed Martin was less than a mile from the Pentagon, so it, it was just a, an easy short drive to get over there to the Pentagon parking lot and then go to the Pentagon. So my, my plan was to get to the Pentagon um, for my shift at 2 o'clock. Well, about whatever it was, 9.45 or something, well, early before that, we were watching TV. We, we, we were watching the, the World Trade Centers in New York. And then as we were watching the TV, suddenly out the window, the window faced north out towards Washington, D.C., and the Pentagon was off to the left a little ways. And there was a building right in front of us, but over the top of the building, we saw this huge amount of smoke and debris. We thought, well, what's that all about? I thought and it didn't even connect in my mind. I thought there must have been some construction accident because there was a big crane. They were building something over there. And I thought maybe the crane fell over and it stirred up all this stuff. And then we heard, no, the Pentagon had been hit. And because and, we didn't hear anything uh, through the windows and through the, the walls. We just saw this big amount of smoke and, and stuff. And then we saw stuff fluttering down through the sky. So I was on active duty that week and spent an awful lot of time at the Pentagon the rest of that week uh, keeping the Secretary of Defense surprised of what was going on, of how badly the Pentagon was damaged, because we got reports from a lot of different places. We kind of consolidated all that stuff together and then let the Secretary know what was going on. And spent a lot of time at the Pentagon between uh, September 11th and the next probably three years after that. Um, it was it was almost it wasn't quite the same but it was almost like having two full time jobs, uh, Lockheed Martin during the day and then the Pentagon at night. Um, it was probably two weeks out of the month that I was over the Pentagon uh, for eight hours a day, and it was all related to um, counterterrorism and the threat that we faced after nine eleven. We we would get every day a list you know, a stack of maybe a twelve page or so stack of uh, papers. It was, a, it was a, like an Excel matrix of a number of different threats, where they were from, uh, how they came in, you know, what kind of a uh, source it was, a lot of information, what the threat, the target was, and a lot of different information about the different threats. And it was just page after page. There were like 10 or 12 of these on each page. And it was just page after page of all these threats that we were picking up all around the world to U.S. facilities, U.S. personnel, both overseas and uh, domestically, and and the also the intelligence community would also run these what they called uh, red teams, where they would have a team of analysts that would act like they were a terrorist cell and say, okay, if we wanted to do something, well, how would we do it? They write up reports of how they would do stuff. There's an awful lot of focus on that. Just a couple of months uh, after 9/11, it was probably December. I was at the at the Pentagon on one of these shifts, you know, and I don't know if it was, it seems like it was on a weekend. I don't remember if it was or not, but I was there at the Pentagon and just down the hall from where my office was there, and the office, do you know what a SCIF is? It's probably an SCI facility. It's a it's a classified kind of a environment. It's a it was an area that was bigger, probably two or three times the size of this room. And there were different cubicles and things, and there was an office up in the front where I was that uh, uh, that had a secure phone in it, and just down the hallway, a little bit farther, there was a little, there was a briefing room. But then, just past the briefing room, was a secure video teleconference center that the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary was up there, and he was on the uh, video teleconference with the President and the and Secretary of State and a bunch of others, and they were talking about this stuff, talking about what was going on. One of the generals that was in that meeting came running out of the the uh, video teleconference center into my office and uh, made a secure phone call. And I can't tell you exactly what he said, but there was, they were concerned that there were very specific threats to the Washington, D.C. area involving uh, nuclear weapons uh, from terrorist groups. So there was, a, there was a real fear of that going on. There was another incident up in Indiana that they were um, following and, and trying to thwart uh, activity going on there. I mean, there was some real serious threats going on, and we were really concerned about what was happening. Um, 
let's see, what else? Um, another thing that I've been doing lately now with, uh, with Senator Bennett is, um, and I went to work for Senator Bennett about three years ago, it's almost three years ago now, and, and mainly it's, well, I guess not mainly, I, I just wanted to uh, get back into the Congress again. I've worked around, in and around Congress for a long time, and my kids had all grown up. They all went here to BYU and, and uh, are thriving now. <laughs> they're doing great. They're all, they're, in fact, they're all doing very well. But they, um, they all graduated from BYU. They're all on their own, kind of making their way through life. And so I thought this would be a great chance to go back to Capitol Hill again and uh, get back on the inside again instead of as a lobbyist trying to orchestrate coalitions and try to get things done, actually be on the inside where you're doing stuff. So I went back up there, and uh, one of the reasons I went back is because Senator Bennett is involved in a group called the Transatlantic Policy Network, um, the TPN. It's not really high profile, but it's, uh, as far as being in the news a lot, but it's, a, it's an organization, it's a group that really gets a lot of stuff done. They are, and it's a group of, of legislators, you know, members of the House and Senate here, members of the European Parliament, and then, uh, there are business leaders um, in Europe and in the United States, you know, like Daimler Chrysler. Um, what's uh, some of these other uh, AT and T? Um, there's a bunch of I can't think of all the companies now, but there's a bunch of companies that are represented in this. There are uh, academic groups that are, and think tanks that are that all kind of meet together, and they meet together kind of small groups where they can talk about important kinds of things. They meet together with um, uh, prime ministers, foreign ministers of countries, that kind of level of stuff. Anyway, what what Senator Bennett has been working on over the past couple of years is getting uh, not a free trade agreement between the U.S. and the EU in place because a free trade agreement I don't think is would be acceptable to a lot of folks, and so it would be blocked. You wouldn't be able to get a free trade agreement done. But what they've been working on is just short of a free trade agreement, there's an awful lot of regulatory unification that we could do between the U.S. and the EU in a lot of areas, in financial things, in um, um, agriculture, uh, in, in a number, number of different areas. You could, you could unify the regulations that we put in place and that they put in place and make those similar so that we could facilitate trade between the two a lot better than, uh, than it occurs now. So we pushed this pretty hard in some of these TPN meetings in Europe and in the U.S. over the past couple of years. Last December, just as we were finishing up the, uh, the year in Congress, we, um, we got a resolution passed. We drafted a revolution, resolution in our office uh, supporting this idea of this unifying the, and the regulations. Got it passed. And then uh, in, in January, Germany took over the presidency of the EU. And their new chancellor, Angela Merkel, saw that resolution and said, hey, that's what I need. That she adopted that idea, because we'd been talking to her and her people too. And she saw that resolution that was passed and said, hey, this is something we could move. When the EU-US summit occurs this spring, that's probably going to be something that will be on the agenda that they're going to try to get implemented, is, is to regularize and formalize this, this thing. So anyway, there's some things that we're doing right now that, uh, that, are, that are hopefully trying to help the, the international business climate and international diplomatic and, and uh, um, economic climate as well. We, uh, Senator Bennett is also a member of the uh, State Foreign Operations and Tele or, uh, Appropriations Subcommittee. Uh, that's a subcommittee that funds all of our foreign aid, all of our embassies around the world and the State Department. And so uh, we're pretty involved in uh, and those kinds of things to talk. There's a lot of ambassadors, a lot of foreign ministers, a lot of those kinds of folks that come through our office all the time and, and want to meet. I've got a bunch of other things I want to talk to you about, but, um, but let me ask if there's questions that you guys have on any of this or anything else, um, whatever you have on your mind, and see what we can do about it, uh, responding to questions. Maybe not answering the questions, but responding to the questions. <laughs> Anybody have anything? Yeah. Saint and as a parent, what aspect of your government service did you find the hardest? Like, did it compete with, uh, you know, traveling, having long hours? Or did they compete with family? Yeah, kind of. It kind of does. DC is kind of an interesting place. It's a different kind of a pace of life, I think. 
um, right now I go to work, I leave home about 8 o'clock in the morning, which isn't that early actually. I leave about 8 because we start at 9 o'clock on Capitol Hill and I, and I get to work around 9, uh, usually a little before or after or whatever if I leave a little bit later. But, anyway, but I don't le usually leave work until, I mean the earliest would be 6, but it's usually closer to 7, sometimes later. And usually what I do now for the, for the past, past several years, I've been, I just go straight from work to something else. I don't go home. I mean, dinner time at home is about 9.30 or 10. And so I don't get home until then most nights. And that, but that's just kind of the way it is. And, and uh, that's just kind of life in D.C. So they just have to realize that that's what you're getting into. It's, it's not always that way. When I was with Lockheed Martin, we didn't have to work as late, but a lot of times there'd be evening functions to go to. You know, uh, there'd be a lot of uh, fundraiser kinds of things and dinners and uh, there's still some of that. I'll, I decline a lot of that now. But, but it is, it's kind of a balance you have to strike. Um, and it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it, it's doable. Um, my kids, I don't think, suffered too much. My, my job when the kids were growing up was to, was to put them to bed at night and read to them. And so I, would, I did find a way to get home when they were home uh, at a decent hour in order to, to read to them and put them to bed every night. I mean, every, even, even when my son was like a junior in high school, he'd still say, is it, is it time for you to read to me, isn't it? <laughs> so we'd go to his room and we'd read and, and uh, put him to bed. So anyway, it was one of these things that we would continue to do. Um, and so I, I did find time to do that kind of stuff. But it is kind of a challenge to balance all that. That's a good question, though. Yes? I think the White House was. I mean, all of them have been very interesting. But, but at the White House, let me, let me give you an example. When I was at the, at the Pentagon, we would try, we would brief the chief of staff, and, uh, and there were professional briefers. You know, we would, we, as the analysts, we would write the briefing, and then we'd give it to the briefers, and they would actually brief. And so we weren't actually there all the time. Sometimes we'd go, and other times we wouldn't, but our stuff would be briefed. If the, if the chief, chief of staff had a question and the briefer didn't know the answer, then we'd have to get the answer back to him. And the, and the goal was to get the answer back to the chief of staff 24 hours after he asked the question. And it was really hard to do that. Not because it was hard to answer the question, because that was the easy part. The hard part was getting it through all the different offices that had to read it and change happy to glad and all this kind of stuff before you could get it back there. When I went to the White House, when the president wanted to get something and he needed it, you could just take a piece of paper and a map and hand write on it and draw arrows and hand it to the National Security Advisor. He'd take it to the Oval Office and say, here's the answer. So it, it was really nice to, that you could just cut through all that extra bureaucracy and just get the job done. Um, so in that sense, it was really fulfilling to be able to get something done and see that there was a, a change um, in policy or change in what we were doing. It, it, you, could have, you could see a direct effect on what you were doing and what was happening in terms of U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, I don't you exactly what you mean. This was this was all occurring around the Christmas holiday season, and we thought there's something that's going on. We're pretty sure there's something that's going to happen. We didn't know exactly when or exactly where. We knew it was going to be Europe, but Europe is a big place, and so we thought, well, can we shut down all the airports in Europe for two weeks during the Christmas holidays? And we thought that's probably not going to go over too well, but. We didn't have specific enough information um, as to what was going to happen. It's, it, and I've thought about 9-11 since then, and people say, why didn't we see that coming? And there was an awful lot of chatter. They keep saying there's a lot of chatter going on. It was the same kind of a thing. There's a lot of chatter going on, a lot of people talking about what was going to happen. We didn't know exactly what was going to happen or where or when, but we knew something was going to happen. And so after it happens, then it's clear. You know exactly what it was. But before, you don't know enough to be able to pinpoint it and say, this is, this is the group, these are the people, this is the place, this is the time, um, until after it happens. But after it happens, it all crystallizes. And you, you can, then you can separate all the other stuff that's, that's extraneous 
and, and the clues are right there. But when there's all the other stuff around, it's hard to see the clues that really you can put together and say this is the answer. Because some people were saying, up to, leading up to this, uh, uh, this airliner getting uh, shot or, or blown up, some people were saying Munich was a place to look at. Others said um, uh, Frankfurt, and others said Paris and Amsterdam. And, and, and even Athens, you know, because Athens was a player, but, uh, but uh, we didn't know enough. And those are pretty big airports to just shut down for a while because of a threat that's going on. So that was something we thought about and considered in, and decided it, we couldn't shut the airports down or shut Europe down, and, uh, and we didn't. And 9-11, and you know, the same kind of thing, you know, do you shut down airports based on a threat uh, a kind of a vague threat. You don't know exactly where it's coming from, but it's going to come from somewhere. So that's that's a tough thing that policymakers have to deal with: of how specific is the threat, where is it, and is it enough to um, to disrupt whatever kind of activity, and in this case, airline activity. Oh yeah. What are the What are the most important things to learn at, at this period while they're still at the university? to set them up to do what, what you've been doing and to be effective at it. Okay. Um, well, stay in school, get a haircut, shine your shoes, <laughs> uh, finish up, to get a, get a, uh, learn how to study, learn how to analyze. Um, when, I was, when I was working in all these places, I was working with people who uh, had been educated at Stanford and at Harvard and Princeton and different places like that, and, and I found that I could do the same job they were doing. And part of it, I think, might be confidence, too, that uh, you're not disadvantaged by coming from BYU instead of from an Ivy League school or some you know, high-tier kind of a place. I mean, BYU is no slouch. But uh, I think have confidence in what you've been able to do here and the degree that you've earned here that uh, you'll be able to be just as good as anybody else or better than anybody else. In fact, probably better than some people because of the discipline that you've had in going to school here, that the, the requirements, the honor code is different than other places, and so I think that gives you some discipline and some focus that others haven't been able to get. But um, I think it's important also uh, to uh, when you when you're working when you, when you get out in your first job when you leave here is to come to work early, stay late, work hard. Um, do a, a really good job. Do more than you do more than is, ex is expected. If they if they want you to do, or maybe they could do the same thing here. Do a little bit more than than is expected, more than is asked. Um, it, it it can make a big difference in uh, in the way you probably the way your professors look at it, but also in the way your employer later on will look at uh, at you, uh, because you, as a new employee you'll be compared to others. And if you do things a little bit better than others and work a little bit harder, stay a little bit longer, don't kill yourself and, um, and get your life out of balance because balance is critical. You can't just focus on one thing. You've got to make sure that there are other parts of your life too. But those are some of the things that come to mind in, uh, in response to that. Who else has questions? Yeah. I have a question. Um, what languages would you suggest uh, would be most most effective right now, um, other than Arabic, I mean, Turkish, Urdu, um, I think Mandarin, Chinese would be, yeah. And maybe Korean, but I think Mandarin would probably be a really good one to learn from an international relations kind of standpoint, but also international business standpoint. Uh, that's probably where things are going, I think. Um, for the intelligence community, that would be a big one, too. Japanese would probably be good, but I think... Uh, Chinese, you know, Mandarin would probably be the one to, to go for. That's when I would, I mean, Arabic would be really good, too. I mean, obviously, it is for, for you guys, but, uh, uh, but I think Mandarin would be another good one to know. Yeah? This is a question regarding, you were, you said you were in the Pentagon uh, three years after 9-11, so you were there in preparation of the briefs and going into the morning line. Right. And when... Uh, what role, if any, did the Pentagon play in preparing Colin Powell's speech in front of the UN Security Council? And as a military intelligence analyst, did you find his argument 
convincing that this did show, or the slam dunk, that this did show that there were weapons of mass destruction there? Yeah, I was convinced there were. I, I was a, an analyst during the Iran-Iraq war, and so I, I knew firsthand, well, maybe not firsthand, but secondhand at least, f uh, from intelligence reports that, that Saddam Hussein did use chemical weapons against the Iranians and against the Kurds. So I knew that he had chemical weapons. And so I, that was a given. I just, everybody just knew that. Well, that was 16 years prior. Then. Right. And, and it, it was also after a long engagement of weapons inspectors that went through there. The, yeah, but they. So, but, so I was, right. Did you, uh, the, the aerial photos that he showed, those other things, that was convincing to you that yeah. there was? Yeah, it was, because there had been other reports during that interim period, that other interim time, that, that he was continuing the chemical and biological weapons programs and looking for nuclear uh, technology as well. I mean, the, the Osirak nuclear reactor that was bombed in 81, I think. Yeah. We knew that, you know, I, I, was, I was convinced that he had weapons of mass destruction. In fact, I think... Uh, there are intelligence reports that I read after the, uh, after the war began in, in 03 that I probably can't tell you in detail about that some people were thinking that, that some people described ways that um, they were able to hide the stuff, some stuff. Yeah, I mean, these were CIA informants that said, I was there, this is what happened, this is how they did it, and this is why nobody can find it. So I've, I've seen those reports. I, uh, I probably can't say many, much more about it, but I, so I, I was convinced from the beginning that he had it. I, I also knew from a long time of analysis that, that Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi government was supporting terrorist activity. I didn't see any connection between Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi government and Al-Qaeda. Did not. No. I didn't see anything there, but I knew that he was involved in supporting other terrorist groups. And because... Hamas or right. Or yeah. Right. Those kinds of Palestinian, more of the Palestinian kinds of uh, oriented terrorist groups. Now, terrorists um, kind of are in a league of their own and kind of work together. And so I was concerned, as the administration was saying, that, that if Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and they supported terrorist groups, even though there were separate ter terrorist groups, that there was a chance that those weapons could get into the hands of people who get into the hands of the other people in Al-Qaeda or some groups that would like to get to the U.S. could use those weapons of mass destruction. When, when the administration started talking about going to war with Iraq, I spent a long time thinking about that, thinking, is this the right thing to do or not the right thing to do? I knew that Saddam Hussein was a really bad guy, and it would be, the world would probably be better off without him around. And I, and I was sure that he had the weapons of mass destruction and that he had the ties to terrorist groups. And, uh, and I thought, but this is still preemptive. You know, this is, you know, Iraq hasn't invaded Kuwait like they did before in 90. They haven't uh, taken overt action. They haven't sold any of this stuff to terrorist groups. You know, this is still a preemptive action if we do it. And so I really struggled for a long time. And then I thought, you know, if it really is true, and, and a lot of this is happening just just after, you know, not long after 9-11, uh, 01. I mean, this, we were still kind of in the aftermath of that, trying to deal with that and all these threats that kept coming in day after day. And, and so I thought, if we wait until one of these terrorist groups uses a chemical weapon or a biological weapon on us in the, you know, the New York subway or in Washington, D.C. or somewhere, if we wait for that to happen, then... Um, have we waited too long? And so, and so, and I thought, yeah, for that reason, you know, in, in another case, you know, in another era, a preemptive attack might not make sense because an attack by a terrorist group would be a hijacking of an aircraft, which is pretty bad, but it's still not the same. Or it could be a kidnapping of an American. But if the, if the terrorist attack is using a weapon of mass destruction that could kill hundreds or thousands of people, that that's, puts us at a different level, or even if they got a, a hold of nuclear weapons, uh, you know, a, a former Soviet nuclear su a suitcase bomb. If, if that kind of thing happened, if we wait for that to happen, then have we waited too long? And so for that reason, I thought it probably does make sense to preemptively go into Iraq and, uh, and make a change there. Isn't that the greater risk, though, with the former Soviet republics 
then give up. And we, uh, we didn't collect those weapons, and so they are can quite possibly be in anybody's hands if they were there yeah. in the first place. May I ask a follow-up question? Sure. sure. This is regarding Hamas, and what ties does Hamas have with Al-Qaeda? If anything, it's, if, any, if they have any, it's been very, very tangential, and only very, very recently. Yeah, but I, but I think that if they had gotten a nuclear weapon or a chemical weapon or biological weapon, and word would have gotten to Al-Qaeda, they would have said, hey, if you guys have that, get us one too. I, you know, they have a common enemy. You know, we, they, neither one of them like us. And, and I think that, that that was my thought process, that if they get it, there may not be a connection between those, but terrorists, you know, bad guys have a kind of a network. They talk to each other. They can understand what's going on in their kind of underworld, and that uh, there would be a way of getting that to Al-Qaeda. Or, they, or, or Hamas could use it against us, or Hezbollah could use it against us. Hamas and Hezbollah have never done attacks against American property. No, they haven't. Or outside of their territories of Lebanon and, right. and, and Palestine, Israel. So I'm trying to, isn't there a no. fundamental difference between terrorist groups that are Al-Qaeda, like anarchists, and Islamic nationalist groups who are... Use terror as a tactic as opposed to yeah. their ideology. But I think I think 9/11 might have changed the world too. Where some of these guys, I mean, I mean at the time I thought the 9/11 attack could have changed their thinking, thinking America is vulnerable. We could use this and attack America. It would and change their philosophy, change their their mo. If your if your job at the Pentagon or at the White House is to secure America and keep us safe. You got to think of all these different things that might happen and could happen. And because if, if something happens and they say, well, why weren't you thinking about it? Then you're in trouble for not thinking about it. And so I was thinking about all these different connections. On 9-11, we had two aircraft that hit the World Trade Center. We had an aircraft that hit the Pentagon. I, what I was looking for, in fact, I was looking up in the sky thinking there might be scuds that were on barges or ships out in the Atlantic Ocean coming into Washington, D.C. I was afraid that that was going to happen because it hasn't happened before, although Iran has tested that way. But, but I was thinking, is, that, is this a coordinated attack where we have that kind of stuff happening too? I, I was really thinking that was going to happen. Obviously, you have to deal with all this stuff. Yeah. So there are, I mean, that's kind of what DOD is paid to do is to think of different alternatives and different scenarios and um, most of them don't happen but if you, you got to think of everything because if you don't then you can really get burned and then people are mad because you didn't think of what happened so anyway that's a response yeah, yeah I served my mission in Germany and uh, all, I, all I heard was uh, anti-Bush anti, uh, when, when was that? this is just uh, I got back in July last year okay. and um, they were very disappointed to hear this Bush was reelected. Well, my question is, they attack America saying you're the self-declared world police. Um, working in the CIA and the, the White House, as you did, do you see that we are um, actively trying to be the world police, or are we doing this in um, our own best interest? No, I'm glad you asked, asked that question, because that's another point I wanted to bring up. Do you, do you guys know Michael Mandelbaum at Johns Hopkins? Let me, get, well, it's finals time, so I won't give you reading assignments, but there are two books that he's written that I think would be interesting for you to, to read on that, kind of on that subject. One is called um, The Case for Goliath, and the second one is called The Three Ideas That Changed the World. I think that's the exact title, but it's, if it's, it's something like that if it isn't. The, the Case for Goliath is, is just what you're saying. It's, it's, he makes a case for a strong U.S. He's saying that the U.S. is the, is the, de facto world government. Um, the U.S. has the biggest, strongest military in the history of the world. And, and why isn't Europe worried about that? You know, why isn't Europe worried that we're going to invade and take over and control all of Europe? Why isn't Africa or Asia or South America concerned that we're going to be the ones that are going to come in and, and take over the whole world? And, you know, because we're not going to do that. I mean, they know that we're not going to do it. Europe doesn't have to have a strong defense because America does. America, uh, Europe has some defense, but not hardly much at all compared to what we've got. And so, because they're not afraid of that. In the history of the world, the Europeans would have been really afraid of another power being so strong because they'd be afraid that they were going to come over and try to take over. But America doesn't do that. You know, we, we're not the ones that are doing that. Um, his other book, The uh, Three Ideas That Changed the World, um, which are peace, um, communication 
and uh, free trade. And, he, and he's saying that the U.S. primarily is, 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 the, is the world, keeps the world at peace, generally. There are skirmishes that happen around the world, but there aren't the huge world wars that we've had in the past. And America, he says, keeps that going. America keeps the, the shipping lines open and allows free trade to happen around the world. Um, communications, in the, in the Roman Empire, the, the communication was the road, you know, the, the road system that the Romans built. In our world, communication is more electronic, you know, that, that America is, is kind of the leader in, in electronic communications and facilitating all that. And it's, it's really grown worldwide. It's not just the U.S., but the U.S. Is a big, played a big part in that. And then uh, free trade. America promotes free trade and, and uh, uh, free trade among nations and with the U.S. So, uh, so my answer to your question is I don't think the U.S. is kind of the big bad guy that, that a lot of the Europeans think we are and a lot of other people think we are. At least our motives aren't that way. Uh, we don't go into, you know, we didn't go into Iraq to occupy that land, take over the resources and make that our own and to subjugate the people to, to us. I mean, our, our goal there was to go there and free them from a, a, a dictator kind of government that was a very oppressive to them. I'm not sure we're replacing it with a, with a system that's helping, but, uh, but the, the, the idea was, was not um, to create an, an American empire uh, throughout the world. Uh, the, the goal was, when we go into a place, like when we went over it, into Europe after World War II, our, our goal there wasn't to take over Europe like, like Hitler was doing. All that we asked for there, and all we asked for in the Philippines and other places was just enough land to bury our dead. And there are American cemeteries in a number of places around the world, and that's all the land that we've asked for. We're not there to conquer and take over the world. By, well, this is right because it's right, or this is right because it's best for America. There's a lot of factors involved in every decision that's made. I think generally people are wanting to do what's best for the country. I think Nancy Pelosi had a good idea in her mind when she went to Damascus and, and met with Assad. What turned out didn't turn out exactly the right way, but I think she was, she was and part of what she was doing might have been, and I don't know what her motivations were, but part of it might have been to show that the Democrats have an idea and a way of getting things done where the Bush administration has. And that's, that was probably part of it too, it might have been domestic. So there are, there are a number of different uh, factors that motivate everybody to do what they do. But I think generally, people at the decision-making level, both in the uh, executive branch and the legislative branch, have, have the country's best interest at heart. They have different approaches, different ways of looking at it, but I think their main goal is to do what's right for the country.